Didn't work. Okay. We are now running. We're recording. Um, and this is our fourth edition of Letters from School. Apparently it is the angry letter edition. Um, so uh, I think everybody here knows the drill. So I'm just going to turn it over um, to my school colleagues with appreciation for them volunteering to do another one of these delightful sessions. Um, and I will keep an eye on the chat if anybody has questions. Um, but with that, I will mute myself and turn it over to Skua. All right, thank you, Jenny. So as we were selecting letters for this edition, we noticed that most of them were very, very angry letters. So we named this the angry letter edition, or as Sean coined it, the who hurt you edition of letters from Skua. So we interspersed letters that were not necessarily as angry to give you a bit of a break in between some of the indignation and rage that um, we read on a near daily basis in some of our collections. <laughs> to start you off, I'm actually going to start with a letter that is not angry at all. It's about um, being passionate about baking cakes. So this is Mary Dale Dixon, and Mary Dale Dixon was the first student to enroll at State Normal in 1892, and she found that she was most interested in courses on baking and sewing. So after she graduated, she used what she'd learned to reach her goal of becoming, becoming a model farm wife. She says in a quote in a newspaper in Raleigh, which is where she moved after she graduated, I was the youngest, the ugliest, and the most uninteresting of five children, and there was a degree of hopelessness about what would become of me, but I told them not to worry. The world was bound to have cooks, and I had been raised in a kitchen from the time I was a month old. When she wasn't taking care of her seven children, she focused on baking, specializing in layer cakes. She began selling them at local farmers markets and she was such a success that she was averaging more than 100 cakes per month and had to turn down new customers. A boarding school in Paris even requested she ship them one of her cakes. Dixon went on to publish an incredibly popular cookbook uh, locally called Making My Cakes With You. And the following short letter is a glowing endorsement of that book. Here is the letter. Kinston, North Carolina, July 27, 1925. Dear Mrs. Mac McNamara, I, want, I just want the farm women of North Carolina to know of the wonderful book on cakes by Mrs. J.W. Dixon of Raleigh. She actually makes cakes with you. The Raleigh special as a layer cake is unsurpassed and the boiled icing is the finest I've ever used. It makes a smooth creamy filling which stands up well. The yellow angel or sunshine cake is especially good for summer use. The women of our state need this book of cakes, and I want to give it my brightest endorsement. Respectfully, Mrs. W.T. Mosley. Okay, it's going to be hard to follow the cakes. Um, all I have is Harriet Wiseman Elliott and uh, World War II. Uh, for those who don't know, Harriet Elliott was uh, born in Illinois in 1884. She joined the faculty of the North Carolina State Normal and Industrial College in 1913 as a teacher of political science. In 1935, she became Dean of Women at the school. In addition to her involvement in education, Elliot gained prominence during the war years as consumer commissioner of the Advisory Commission to the Council of National Defense from 1940 to 1941, chairman of the Women's Division of the War Finance Committee from 1942 to 1946, yeah. deputy director of the Office of Price Administration and U.S. delegate to the U.N. Conference on Education, Science, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, in London in 1945. She was active in various political, civic, and professional organizations, as well as holding memberships on several state committees and commissions. So uh, this is a letter um, written by a concerned citizen from South Carolina. Unfortunately, we cannot decipher the uh, signature and we don't have the envelope, so we, I don't know the name or whether or not the concerned citizen was a male or female or really anything. 
So the Council of National Defense was an organization originally formed in World War I to coordinate resources and industry in support of the war effort uh, during the coordination, um, including the coordination of transportation, industrial and farm production, financial support for the war and public morale. Uh, Harriet Elliott the, was the head of the advisory committee consumer protection division. Um, it is charged with the study of the defense program as it affects the consumer and with the coordination of government activities in the field of public welfare so far as they relate to the defense program. And this was before we were involved in World War II, but the president did know that, uh, you know, we were going to get involved. So we created this commission to sort of focus our economy um, on war production or getting ready for the war and also to get buy-in to the war. Okay, so she, this letter was received by Miss Elliott in May 19, uh, May 31st, 1940, from the said concerned citizen from Bluffton, South Carolina. My dear Miss Elliott, as a consumer and a bona fide Democrat, I wish to voice my objection to your appointment to the advisory board. I may add here that this reflects the outraged opinion of all of the Democrats I know. We would consider a great patriotic service if you, Mr. Hillman, Mr. Henderson, and Mr. Davis refused to serve. We believe this board should represent the best industrial, financial, scientific, and technical brains this nation can muster, that it should be above the slightest suspicion of partisan politics. It would be, it would be just a board were we sufficiently fortunate to have in power statesmen and not politicians. This board should be composed of men, and I said men, who merit the utmost faith and confidence of the American people, all of the people not just those demoralized by government subsidies, not just the bot voters. They should be men who are well known and favorably known by all of the people, who are top notchers in their respective fields. We object to Mr. Hillman because we believe that labor should be represented by a labor expert who is not involved in the destructor labor, destructive labor feud between the AFL and the CIO. We believe that until the CIO rids itself of its communists, it has no moral right to be represented on a board that is preparing a democracy for a possible war. We object to Mr. Henderson on all counts. He hasn't the slightest qualification for this post. What is more to the point, we do not subscribe to Mr. Henderson's political ideology. It is revolting to all intelligent patriotic Americans. We are long past the point where we believe that radicalism is making democracy work. We object to Mr. Davis because he is an unknown factor and because we suspect he was selected for the same reason you and Mr. Henderson and Mr. Hillman were selected. That reason, we believe, is fanatical loyalty to the New Deal. We believe that New Dealism will have priority rights over nations, the nation's security and if one is to be sacrificed or scamped, it will surely be national security. The people, may I say, are in no mood for politicians making politics out of grave peril. They do not give a hoot whether this country is made secure by a Democrat, New Deal, or Republican. They do not give a hoot to whether the New Deal is lost in the scrimmage. I have talked to dozens upon dozens of men and women, all Democrats. The gist of their opinion is, quote, our war is already lost. Our danger is being used as political capital by opportunists. Our people and our country will still be in the hands of incompetent left-wingers and sentimental theorists and Mr. Nudson, Mr. Budd and Mr. St Statinius will be outflanked by a radical majority at every turn. End quote. This is what people are saying and thinking if it interests you to know. Some said to you, of you this evening, quote, I doubt whether half of the people of North Carolina know who she is, let alone the rest of America, end quote. Another said, quote, well, 
Hailing from Chapel Hill puts her in the right side of the fence at least, end quote. They are saying that too. These citizens have a stake in this country. They are, they are its solid citizens who make it possible for this government to function at all. They are the ones who will pay the bill. And they are in a cold fury because their own party cannot place country above politics. The sentiment is dot, 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 what's the use? And I presume there isn't. We shall probably find ourselves in the position of the French when due to the phony humanitarianism of Premier Leon Bloom and his government's tacit approval of strikes and shorter and shorter hours, this is in all caps, not one airplane was manufactured during the last six months of his regime. The blunt truth is that thoughtful Americans do not trust this administration or its inner circle to do the job that must be done. The personnel of this board is proof that neither the wishes nor the demands of the American people have the least influence. The same old gang will be on the job playing the same filthy politics. The same old incompetence will be playing ducks and drakes with America's destiny. Candidly yours, undecipherable signature. Okay, well, this and this is not an angry letter. It's but it's inspiring. Okay, this is um, from Anna Howard Shaw, and there she is there um, in all her glory, and um, she, there I, it's going to be to um, a Miss Canoodle, and there she is in on the corner. So Anna Howard Shaw, a teacher, a preacher, a statesman, a medical doctor, and a suffragist. Anna Howard Shaw was one of the most important and inspirational women of her day. Perhaps best known for her involvement in the suffrage movement and her friendship with Susan B. Anthony, she was elected president of the National Women's Suffrage Association in 1904. Over a decade later, as the country faced the First World War, Dr. Shaw was appointed as the chairman of Women's Committee of the United States Council of National Defense. And it was while serving in that position that she wrote this letter to Miss Ruth Knodel, the president of the Student Government Association of the State Normal and Industrial College, now UNCG. Dr. Shaw had visited the school in 1917 and was sent a thank you note letter signed by almost all of the students at the all-girls school. Dr. Shaw's letter reflects her genuine affection for the students and her strong advice to value themselves as individuals and not merely as a support system for men. So it was written um, on stationery of the Women's Committee, Council of National Defense from Washington, D.C., May 17, 1917. Dear Ms. Canodal, it is exceedingly difficult for me to express my sincere appreciation of the communication which you and the student body of the State Normal College so kindly sent me in regard to my recent visit. If I were as great a source of inspiration and pleasure to you as you were to me, and as a letter signed by the entire student body is and always will be to me, I assure you that my visit was not in vain. There is nothing which gives me greater comfort in life than to know that I have been able to be of service to the young womanhood of the country and to stir in them not only the desire to do things, but the recognition of their own value as human beings. Too long the world has taught young women that their personal work in life was to inspire and build up the work of men, failing to realize that each girl was a distinct individual in herself, and that it was a great service to build up her character and make it worthy as to assist in the building up of another, and that the greatest service a woman could render was to become herself a strong and noble and self-respecting human being. The spirit of democracy is entering into the hearts of women as well as of men and changing us all so that through our own self-respect, we are better able to respect others. By developing a sense of justice toward ourselves, we are able to become just to others for no one can really be just to another human being who is willing to permit others to be unjust to her. Please extend to the students, one and all, my appreciation of this great kindness you have shown me by your letter, which shall carefully preserve among my treasured possessions. Believe me, faithfully, Anna Howard Shaw. So back to being angry. <clears throat> this is um, constituent correspondence written to Howard Coble. Howard um, was the longtime um, US Rep House of Representatives member from 
um, Guilford County. Uh, he represented District 6, which included um, Guilford, Durham, and about 10 other counties. He served from 1985 to 2015, and he died like a few months after he left office. So I think he was really into his job. But this is from Harold David Parks, one of his constituents from Lexington, North Carolina. February 17th, 1989. Dear Sir, throughout my entire life, I've been an honest, law-abiding, hard-working citizen. I have devoted myself to caring for my family and helping others, and served in the Army in Vietnam. No matter what others have said, I have loved and respected our country, even after I had to swallow our bitter defeat in Vietnam. Now, however, I'm becoming disillusioned with the way things are going in our country. Please bear with me while I explain. In the media, the rights which our citizens have enjoyed since our country was founded are being attacked daily. We citizens are portrayed as simple-minded dopes who always need more rules and laws to protect us from ourselves and others from us. Now the liberals are using the bodies of tragically murdered California school children to push forward their social agenda. In many ways, they have already taken away our right of self-determination. Now liberal lawmakers want to take away my right to keep and bear arms. <clears throat> These people want anyone to be free to get rid of unborn babies on a whim, but they are willing to let murderers and drug pressures go free with only a slap on the wrist. The man who murdered the California children had been arrested on five separate occasions for felonies, but was allowed to go free because of liberal laws and courts. Why wasn't he stopped? These people brand me a nut for enjoying shooting my semi-automatic deer rifle. I have never been convicted of anything more than a traffic violation. Yet these people want to legalize drugs which are ruining the lives of our young people. I know, I am a teacher. Something is dreadfully wrong when a few zealots can stir up people to push forward their strange socialist agenda which defies all logic and common sense. I often ask myself, why do they want to disarm law-abiding citizens and at the same time let criminals roam the streets almost at will? I'm beginning to wonder if sometime in the future I might be dragged from my home in the middle of the night for something I said. Will I, in the future, be pushed and herded in any direction some socialist finds convenient? Will the police invade my home to confiscate property which I bought legally and with good intentions? Do the socialists fear the law-abiding citizens so much that they need to invade my life at every turn because they distrust me so much? Will they confiscate my car because of the potential harm it might cause? What about my kitchen knives, my son's baseball bat, my letter opener? Does our government no longer trust any of its citizens? Are we to be treated as simple-minded sheep who must have a law to guide us in our every movement? I ask myself, if my government does not trust me, can I trust my government? Please, sir, vote against Congressman Howard Ber Berman's recently introduced anti-firearms legislation on semi-automatic firearms. Please, sir, get legislation through which will get the murderers and other criminals off our streets, even if it, even if it means making hard decisions which have not been made so far, such as the death penalty for drug dealers, pushers, and criminals who use firearms to commit felonies. Put pressure on the drug supplier countries, even military pressure. Please, sir, help us law-abiding citizens get the respect we need. Please protect our freedoms. We are doing the best we can in a bad situation. Just trust us a little. Your supporter, Harold David Parks. Back. It's your chance to up to Sean, unmute, unmute, Sean, unmute. Thought I was unmute, but anyway. No, so, tragically. Uh, classic Zoom call. Um, so this is a letter that's not angry at all. Uh, it's from the SGA president, Catherine White, to Betty Motley. All right, so I'm just going to read it. So, dear Betty, here it's June 24, and I'm still in the SGA office. And being in Greensboro, guess what phenomenal, phenomenal of the weather I'm watching? Right, it's raining outside, but that ain't gonna dampen my spirits and plans for September. Betty, I need you to, I need you desperately to do one bang up job with a big job. I need someone, you, to be the chief director of the SGA skit to be presented to the Frosh. Do you remember the one presented your freshman year? I don't either. That's why I said this was a big job. The skit's gotta be changed. Let me be brief 
Let me brief you on how I feel about this skin. One, it should have lots of oomph. This is almost first impression on the SGA that the frosh have. Two, the real feeling and atmosphere about women's college and SGA should be projected. Three, time for practice is very limited. There can't be any memorized lines. Four, the president, vice president, and J board chairman should have brief speeches. Five, it should be dignified, short, but very impressive. Don't clutch. I know you're not majoring in drama. I said to myself, mom is the one. She's got initiative and ingenuity. <laughs> That's all you need. The idea is to introduce the SJ to the frosh. Write me back a big yes and put on your thinking cap to the light, the lighting, et cetera. Slides projected on the backdrop could be used. You might confer with Margaret Martin about what the plans for the junior class skit. That skit is that Elliot Hall will follow the SGA skit in ACOP. We want to suck him dead, but be, be serious. Just this once, anyway. Miss Burns is going to mail me a copy of the old skit, the one where they use the giant pine needles, if she can find it. I'll dispatch it to you just for reference. I'm anxiously awaiting your reply. Forgive my typing. Are you running with the junior house president next year? If so, please inform. With bated breath, Catherine Light. Okay, so Jonas Strucker, like many cellists of his time, was an avid smoker, and he averaged three packs a day, but toward the end of his life, he cut back to one pack. He actually included this in his obituary. He was so proud of his smoking habits. His smoking was infamous, and one of the conditions of accepting his collection is that I had to take his ashtray, actually. I've always been fascinated with smoking cellos because they smoke while they play and hold their cello, and Starker played on cellos that were in the hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars range, so they would get ashes all over their cellos. Here's a letter in which the University of Indiana at Bloomington is ordering that there be no smoking in their facilities, and Starker is objecting to this imposition. September, oops, September 22nd, 1993. Dear Charles, as I am leaving for a European tour in a few hours, I would like you to know my decision concerning the announcement of a total ban on smoking at IU as of November 1st. If the smoking ban is enforced in room 405 of the School of Music on October 30th, I will hold the last class there. If the ban is enforced in my studio room, 155, I will teach at home until the end of the school year, 1993-94, and you will have my retirement from my position immediately thereafter. I am sick and tired of the health terrorist actions in Bloomington and the meek non-existent resistance displayed by the administrators. When individual rights are trampled on by the mob, I don't want to associate with them. Yours in old friendship, Dr. Janu Starker, cellist and distinguished professor. Okay, this letter, if you're uncomfortable with bodily functions, maybe go do something, but if you can forge on. Uh, this is a letter from an army nurse, Nina Harmon, to a friend back home near uh, Janet. We don't really know who Janet is, but she apparently asked for details. So Nina Harmon served in the Army Nurse Corps from 1970 to 1977 and in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve from 1978 to 1998. She was called up for active duty for the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, and served in Saudi Arabia at the 312th Evacuation Hospital, which was based in Greensboro. Uh, Harmon retired in 1998 with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Just a reminder of what was Operation Desert Storm, uh, which was from January to February 1991 in its combat phase. It was a war raged by coalition forces from 35 nations led by the United States against Iraq in response to Iraq's invasion and annexation of Kuwait arising from oil pricing and production disputes. Just wanted to throw that out because we have so many wars, it's hard to keep up. Okay, 22nd January 1991. Dear Janet, surprise of surprises, the 312th finally left Fort Bragg. 
We were going to leave on the 18th, but our flight got canceled. No crying here. It was the night they started bombing Israel. The next night though, there was no turning back. We had five cattle cars, which are troop movement vehicles that fit on the back of a semi-cab. They are two level and have multiple benches inside on which to sit. But even so, it took two trips to take us all over to Pope Army Airfield. We got there about 6.30 p.m. and shortly thereafter, they started taking us in groups of 50 in alphabetical order to weigh us with our carry-on baggage. I figured I was probably carrying 80 to 85 pounds extra on my person with my A bag, which is a carry-on bag like a big Jing bag, my web belt, on which I had suspended two ADA pouches containing a Walkman and headphones, the novel The Shell Seekers, some envelopes, and a travel pillow. Also, I was carrying a hip pouch with my camera and case and a running suit, two canteens full of water with cases and cups, my first aid pouch, my poncho, which is pretty heavy, and my ammo pouch in which I had a pair of gloves, a pair of underwear, two tapes, and some string. I carried like a shoulder bag, a map case with a lot of cards to send home to the family. Birthday, Valentine, and everyday cards, about 60 of them, and pens, scissors, and my journal, which I write in sporadically. We also had to carry a bag with our chemical protective gear that weighed about 15 pounds. In my group, which weighted, we had a couple of very large sergeants, 250 to 350 pounds. I was so afraid my group would be overweight, but they let the officers get off and kept the NCOs behind. Mom says it's bad to go to war, but if you must go, it's better to go as an officer. I agree. We had to walk 100 to 200 yards with our stuff to a hangar-like holding area. It was very heavy, but I made it. The holding area was nice in that they had coffee, noodle soup, benches, and bathrooms. We thought we'd be sitting outside in the runway all that time. They called roll three different times for accountability. I got together with three other people and we played a rubber of bridge. It took us about two hours because we kept going down at first until we got a little used to each other's bidding. It was fun, but the cement floor was pretty hard. My cards will never be the same again. I took, I took ones we don't use much. At about 1.20 a.m., they started calling us to go out to the runway, and we got on the plane at about 2.15. It was pretty cold outside, but luckily I was near the end of the list and only had to wait, out, wait outside for 20 minutes. We flew on a commercial plane, but the under the seat space was reduced due to personal flotation devices placed under each seat. Though the flight went smoothly with limited stops, we ended up being on the plane about 19 and a half hours. We flew via Bangor, Maine, Bangor, Maine for refueling and Brussels, Belgium for resupply while our commander had a briefing. We didn't get off either plane. We got to see London, Paris, and the Riviera by night. The left side of the plane got to see Rome too. We sure hit a lot of capitals. We also flew over Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The last couple of hours were pretty scary, flying in a big plane near enemy airspace at times. Just before we got to our airport, they turned the lights on out on the runway and we had to circle a long time until the lights came back on. The pilot could see firing in the distance, not a settling feeling. I was so thankful when we landed at 5.30 a.m. Saudi time only slept about four hours in the plane, so was weary, but with all the adrenaline flowing, no one seemed sleepy at that time. We offloaded all of our equipment, duffel bags and rucksacks, and moved them a ways. I couldn't believe when we got off the airplane, we were in the middle of nowhere. No buses, no vehicles, except for flatbed trucks for our equipment. I was wondering how far we would have to carry our stuff to get somewhere. We only had to carry it about 200 yards. It was actually smoggy that morning, smog meaning sand plus fog, and when it finally cleared about 10 a.m., I saw several buildings fairly nearby. We finally got a bus to bring us to our temporary quarters about 2 p.m. Thought, thought it was very near, but it was about an hour and a half trip because we had to take a very circuitous, though interesting, route. 
there had been many transportation devices that you might expect to see at a facility like that, and they were loaded. As soon as we hit, we started drinking water to prevent heat problems. They had cases of it over in a little covered area they had. We tried their version of an outhouse. It was a fairly primitive, a four-holer. From the waist level down was plywood and above that to a low roof with screen wire to improve ventilation. It was a rectangular building about two foot by four foot. Someone had to hold the door from the outside but it kept, because it kept falling open. Even with all the screen wire and the fact that it wasn't too hot, the smell was not great. I'm giving you a lot of details because you seemed interested in our goings on. If it is too tedious for you to read, I can trim it down. The buses finally came and about two thirds of the way there, one girl's bladder got so full she couldn't stand it. So she cut off the top of a one and one half liter bottle and used that in the aisle of the bus. Right after that, one of the buses behind us passed us and pulled over. About 20 people, mostly men, jumped off the bus and ran behind the sand dunes. I had to go by then, but I didn't want to get arrested and shot at dawn. As soon as the bus stopped, I ran into the headquarters building. We've been here two days, two nights now, and it's been interesting. The days we spent relaxing, adjusting to the eight hour time change, unpacking, although we were only here temporarily. Our nights are pretty busy. Two times the first week, we ended up in our special charcoal lined suits, etc for one and a half to two hours each time in our windowless area. We are so grateful for the Patriot missiles. As one girl said, and we all feel, they are tax dollars well spent. One British announcer on the radio last night said, we may feel safer with Patriots and Scud missiles than we would with the traffic in DC. I don't know if I would agree. They're both nerve wracking, but I'm more familiar with one than the other. With the charcoal of our suits, our hands and bodies are perpetually black. It's worse than camping, black under the fingernails, that is. Didn't get much sleep that night either. Last night was better. Though they started bombing earlier, we only had to get up once and not for that long. The tension is telling on some people. They are much more likely to lash out. I feel myself wanting to do it sometimes, but I'm able to bite it back so far. We have breakfast and dinner served by Saudis and our lunch is a prepackaged meal. For breakfast, we had powdered scrambled eggs and creamed mystery meat, which I did not eat. And French toast, French fries, cornflakes, a donut and a croissant. For dinner, we had a scrawny chicken, green beans and mashed potatoes and gravy that had a interesting flavor. They served pita bread with dinner. It was about 10 to 12 inches wide. They had it halved and, it, and heaped in a big pile. I didn't feel too great after dinner, but it didn't last long. Missed breakfast today because of an alert. I may lose some of the weight I gained at Fort Bragg if I haven't already. Wish I could use a set of scales, though a broom or a dust buster would be more useful right now. Well, take care and write, Nina. P.S. We can't throw TP in toilet. It messes up plumbing. Had to retrieve it with hand once for Major Nina Harmon, 312th Evac Hospital Operation Desert Shield slash Storm, APO, New York. Okay, this is me. This is, um, you are looking at Elizabeth McLaughlin. She was the president of the student body of North Carolina College for Women, which of course is now UNCG. Um, this letter was included in her scrapbook, which you see to the right chronicling her college experiences from her arrival in 1927 to her graduation in 1931. So a lot going on at the campus that time. We saw from her scrapbook that she was um, in a Ledekian Literary Society. There were, at that time, there were four literary societies that kind of functioned as social sororities. And you see her class color was red in the 1931 little snippet um, that she had in her, her um, scrapbook too. So this letter is from, it's to Elizabeth from another student who is feeling very, very badly. Dated December 8th, 1928. Dearest Elizabeth, yesterday I wasn't feeling so good and I wrote a letter to you that I have decided wasn't so good either. I'm writing another. I have something awful to tell you, something I never thought I would have to tell, something so unforgivable I wish that you were here next to me instead of me having to write it so 
that I could have a little comfort in knowing that you could be, be that you could better understand. I never thought that such a thing could ever happen to me. Remember that I am taking you into my confidence. You are the only one I trust and believe in. You don't know how not knowing this thing has worried me. In fact, it has been worrying me every day since I came up here. I never thought that I'd ever have to worry about such a thing. It's entirely beyond my comprehension. If I tell you, will you not breathe it to a single soul? Let it be between you and me entirely? Oh, I just can't tell you. I thought I could, but I'm afraid you'll never forgive me. In fact, I'm about sure that you'll never be broad-minded enough to forgive such a thing. But really, believe me, it wasn't my fault. The fault was that of another person entirely. I couldn't help it. But now that it's happened, will you forgive me? Could you? That's the one thing I hope and pray for, that you'll forgive me. I can't even hope that we'll be friends after this. But at best, I have the satisfaction of obtaining your forgiveness. I had to tell someone before I told you because I had to get advice about telling you. She's beside me now and she advised me to tell you even though it would mean the end of our friendship. Mm -hmm. I just can't put, up, put it off any longer, so I'll have to tell you. Here it is. I'm thrilled to, to death to be a deacon. Oh my God. Can this be forgiven? Miss Aubrey Herney. So our very overly dramatic author is writing a very tongue-in-cheek style about her membership to the Deakian Literary Society. So beginning in 1893, the state normal created two literary societies, um, the Adelphian and Cornelian, but these later grew, and because the school grew, they had the Deakian Society that was established in 1918. So that's what all that very uh, overly dramatic letter was about. I thought she was going to be pregnant or something. Yeah, we were so disappointed. All right. Well, this letter is um, <clears throat> very angry. So a little background here. This letter is from the wife of Rene Leroy. He was a renowned uh, flutist. And it resulted from an incident that occurred at an event held after a concert where he had played um, concertos by both Mozart and Leclerc, and he was accompanied by the cellist Jano Schultz. Miss Leroy is writing to, to Mrs. Schultz. Keep in mind that the concert and the party occurred in March 1942, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and everyone's nerves are on edge. This letter is New York City, May 4th, 1942. My dear Mrs. Schultz, recently I have been visiting in Philadelphia. My friend you met on the evening of March 4th again says that she never saw anything like your breach of etiquette. We both agree, as we did at the time, that your coming to us gushingly and immediately, taking us to the parlor, isolating us from the entire affair was beyond the pale. A Pearl Harbor trick, gush, thus covering up your scheme and status. Nothing that is said could ever change my opinion of what you did. If your interest were where a married woman's should be, you would not have been extremely jealous and you would not have done this despicable act. You cannot walk over me and in fact anyone without getting drastic results. I will not allow anyone to break up my friendships. Your saying that I am jealous has positively no ground. You evidently have an abnormal opinion of yourself. There is nothing I can see to be jealous of you. You have not one thing that I wish. I have much more than my share in every possible way. Who and what are you that you feel you have the right to do such things? It is just these kinds of acts that have brought on the war. I ask you to get busy and work and discipline yourself and assist in progress. 
not to pull down the world with wrong thinking. Your act was a great affront to the guest of honor as well to my friend from Philadelphia. It was an honor to bring my friend to your house as she belongs to one of the oldest Philadelphia families. No one could have a better social position, better breeding, nor finer principles than she has. I am too, too ashamed of you to tell anyone about this experience as I would not want anyone to know that I associated with anyone who would do anything like that. So the only ones that know are the ones involved. Believe me, I am including you in all of my prayers, trusting that you will study Christian principles and reform your ways. Earnestly, in truth, Mrs. Leroy. So I have another piece of constituent correspondence that was sent to Howard Coble. Um, it's relatively short, so this time we also have Howard's response to his constituent, which is always sort of fun. Um, this is from Bob Farrington from Greensboro, North Carolina. January 11th, 1989. Dear Howard, I'm so disgusted with you I could scream. I see you on WFMY TV telling how you and some others will try to force a vote on that pay raise you maneuvered for yourself. Who are you trying to kid? You want the money and a record against it all at the same time. Now I see in the paper that you are giving away free calendars. Well, they were not printed for free and they will not be mailed for free. What they will do is replace is a sale some store might make to a person needing a calendar. And before the next election, my mailbox will be full again of that junk you send out. It goes on and on. Dearly, Bob Farrington. And this is Howard's response. Dear Bob, are you still screaming? I have not responded to your letter before now because I wanted to wait until the pay raise fight had run its course. Despite what you wrote, I was serious about working for the defeat of the ill-timed pay grab. And as the result showed, so were enough other members of Congress. Thanks to response from thousands of Americans who let it be known that this was a bad idea, whose time had not come, we were able to get a recorded vote on the pay raise and it was defeated. I am proud of the role I played in killing the raise. Yes, I give away free calendars. I've given away free calendars every year I've been in office. I am provided approximately 2,000 congressional calendars every year by the U.S. Capitol Historical Society a nonprofit association formed to promote interest in the history of Congress. Each congressional office is given the same allotment. Yes, I do use the franking privilege to mail out some of the copies. Many are picked up in person, but I, I do think this is a legitimate use of the frank. We could argue all day about whether I'm costing some store the sale of a calendar. I don't think so because these are unique. I think I've been a good steward of the taxpayer's trust. I do not abuse the frank, but I do send out several newsletters each year to keep my constituents informed. In fact, I'm preparing my fifth annual questionnaire right now. Most people seem to approve of the mail I send them. I thank you for sharing your thoughts with me. Believe it or not, I appreciate receiving letters such as yours as much as those who praise me for what I'm doing. Without criticism, none of us can ever improve. Thank you for letting me know how you feel. Sincerely, Howard. Okay, this is our final letter, and it is a love letter from Walter Clinton Jackson to his wife, Maddie Redford. So they were one year into their marriage at the writing of this letter, and as you will hear, they were very much in love. And every time you walk by uh, W.C. Jackson's portrait on the first floor, you get to think of this letter. July 12th, 1903, Saturday, 1 p.m. My dear sweetheart, I have never been so busy that I forgot my darling one second or did not have time to tell her that I love her with all my heart. My darling, I think of you especially when I come here. You must surely spend some time with me here. It is great peace. One day is not enough for me at a time here. I meet so many people. I know I can't do anything but talk. 
I come in at 8.30, met old Gunter, and he had to have 30 minutes advice on teaching. I gave it. Mr. Jovel wanted to talk, but he being drunk, I passed on. Mr. John Oliver and he wanted to converse. Mrs. J.R. Gunn, J.M. Findlay, Samar Sims all wanted 30 minutes each. One Governor Patton of Thomasville seized me by the coat. Also, one Mr. Baldwin. I didn't learn any news, however. One Harry also gave me the blues for about 30 minutes. Excuse me for enumerating. They bored me so much, I am disgusted. I don't want to see anyone but my sweetheart. I saw one woman that looked so much like you, I came near having a fit. On a nearer view, I discovered I was easily mistaken. Here I have seen so many women today, and all of them put together in one bunch and multiplied by 60 wouldn't be half as much as you. All their beauty combined would not equal one smile from your beautiful face. Honey, you are the prettiest and sweetest and best woman in all the world. I can't write much now. I wanted to tell you that I'm thinking of you every minute and that I love you good, passing good, yes, I worship my darling. Honey, I'll write you a long letter as soon as I can. <clears throat> I will have to stay here now until 7 p.m. I will therefore make it home about 11 p.m. So I'll write before tomorrow morning again. My dear, my queen, my all, I love you. I can't write much as I have much to do, but I wanted to stop and tell my darling that I think of her every minute and that I love her dearly. Honey, don't forget me. Precious, I will tell you about the rates as quick as possible. It looks now as if July is the only time I could soar away. Thy goodly lover, I love you good. My dearest Jackson. And that was our final letter. We didn't want to leave you with an angry letter. <laughs> all right that was amazing thank y'all so much that was some some good stuff there um does anybody have any questions or anything for our lovely presenters today I mean, there's no question about how lovely you are. Don't well, thank you. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and it will be posted on our ULVLC guide. And we do have a ULVLC session next Friday with Erin talking about Archives 101. It's going to be really fun. And we've got a few other things planned in the coming weeks, so keep an eye out for those emails, and I will see you all soon. All right.